day that the Lord has made. We're rejoicing and we're glad in this day. So glad to be here this morning. Ooh, Lord. <laughs> it is. It's good to be here. And our lesson this morning is coming from lesson number 10. And the subject is called to testify. And our focus is ask Jesus to reveal himself to your community through your witness. Ask Jesus to reveal himself to your community through your witness. We're coming from John 4, 25 through 41. <clears throat> this is a story about the Samaritan woman. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that all of you all are very familiar with this story, uh, how Jesus had need to go through Samaria. The history of the Samaritans can be traced back to, the, to Israel's north, northern ten tribes <clears throat> who formerly disobeyed God. And eventually the Assyrians captured and exiled most people from these ten tribes. And the re remaining two southern tribes, Benjamin and Judea, hated and rejected the remaining nor nor northern brothers because the Assyri Assyrians moved Gentile people in the north. <clears throat> and those Gentiles intermarried with the remaining Israelites. That hatred lasted into Jesus' days. He, however, still cared for the Samaritans. By showing compassion to a Samaritan woman, Jesus drew a part of his, this hated group back to the Father. And this is what we're talking about, uh, how, how Jesus, when, when he comes into the picture, things can change. Amen. The course of the conversation with the woman, Jesus eventually revealed his true identity. And he convinced her that he was Christ. He told her personal details about her life. He spoke to her those empty places in her heart and promised to fill them with himself. And after the Samaritan woman returned to the city, Jesus and his disciples encouraged him to eat the food they bought. But he replied, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Jesus gave them a picture of harvest fields ready for reaping. And in this picture, Jesus was referring to the Samaritans. And then we're going to get on over into the story and then we will break this down uh, to the understanding. <clears throat> Somebody, will, if you will read the Samaritan woman's testimony. John 4, 25 through 30. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Just then did his disciples return and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her with then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came, they came out of the town and made their way toward him. Jesus' meeting with the woman from Samaria at Jacob's well would have raised eyebrows in the Jewish culture of the first century because you know the Jewish and the Samaritans, they hated each other. Uh, they, would, uh, they looked at the Samaritans as dogs because of the inter, uh, intermarriages. <laughs> now see, that's where it comes in about marrying your own. People take this out of context. When, when God told them to not marry, inter, intermarry with each other, you know, not go outside their own race to marry, that wasn't talking about us here, okay? This is talking about when you go outside your race, he said, because the other people that you're gonna inter interlock with, they worship all the gods. And guess what, if you're not pulling them, they're gonna pull you. So this is what he was saying by that, you know, he didn't want them to uh, intermarry with anybody else to marry uh, outside their race because they, he knew that they would start worshiping other gods. And he said that he was their only God because he told them when I bought you out, you know, and set you up on this land, you know, I'm gonna be your God and you're gonna be my people, but they were hard-headed and stiff back, and they did just the opposite of what God told them to do. So it, it raised the eyebrows of the first century. First, no respectable rabbi ever converse, converse with a woman in public. Men just didn't do that. Men didn't talk to women in public back then. A woman seen talking to a man in public probably was put to, put to death. She was stoned to death. Second, no rabbi would have, have allowed himself to associate with a Samaritan because of the intense hatred between, between Jews and Samaritans. Third, no rabbi would have constantly allowed himself to be anywhere near a woman of questionable morals. Now this woman had come to 
uh, the well, Jacob's well, to draw water. And, she, and the Bible says that she came at noontime because she was a woman that people just didn't like. She was a, a harlot, okay? And she had a bad reputation. So she came at this time because she knew nobody would be there to draw water. And for Jesus to be talking to a woman like this, it was very questionable. But Jesus broke these taboos. In fact, through the metaphor of water, Jesus even assured the woman that she could quench her inner thirst by thirsting in him for eternal life. When this woman heard this, let me tell you what she did. She immediately believed that she received the water Jesus offered. She would not have to return to the well each day. This is her corner mind that was saying, but Jesus was thinking of spiritual things. Upon hearing the truth, Jesus spoke the Samaritan woman started to wonder whether he was more than a prophet. She realized that he was more than a prophet. The woman voiced the hope of both Samaritans and Jews, namely that the, the Messiah would come. And at this point, Jesus directly told the Samaritan woman that he was the Messiah. You know, when he started talking to her and telling her about everything that she had done, first of all, he told her, he said, go get your husband. And she said, Lord, I don't have no husband. He said, that you have spoke well of. That is the truth. He said, because you've had five husbands, and the one that you got now is not true. And he told her everything about herself. So she said, surely this man is more than a prophet. You know, because they was believing that, well, the, the Samaritans believed that when the prophet came, guess what? He was going to tell them everything. He was going to put everything into focus. That was their belief. So this woman knew that this man was more than a prophet, and she thought within herself, could this really be the Messiah? Yeah. Then, just then, Jesus' disciples returned with some food, and they were astonished to discover the Savior talking in public to the Samaritan woman, but the Bible says that she had dropped her pot. After he had told her everything about herself, said she dropped her pot and went running back to the city. Yeah. Now, when she got to the city, she began to tell the people about, could this be the Messiah? She didn't say, I saw the Messiah. She said, could this be? You know, this man has told me everything about myself. You know, come see a man. And guess what? They all didn't just come just because of her belief, because nobody was believing what she said anyway. But they came because they were curious. They came to see Jesus for themselves. And when they came, guess what? He was waiting on them. That's, that's something for your testimony. To testify, this woman had a testimony that she could. And listen, saints, all of us got a testimony. All of us can tell somebody about what God has done. Amen. That's our mission here on this earth is to tell somebody what the Lord has done for us. And through your testimony, when you're living and you know that you've been in something and didn't nobody bring you out but God, you got a testimony. And when you tell your testimony, a lot of people say, well, you can't tell everything. Some things you can't tell because people look at you different. But the thing about it, when you know that nobody brought you out but the Lord, you need to tell somebody. Because you never know when somebody's sitting around you or listening to you that that would help. I mean, this woman told her, she didn't keep it to herself. She ran and told not just one person, but she told a whole community about this man. Amen. And then, uh, yet the disciples had been with him long enough to know not to uh, integrate this master. They know not to ask Jesus questions. Yeah. You know, when they came back with the meat. They knew not to ask him with questions because, you know, they knew that he was a savior. Yeah. You know, they knew that he knew what he was doing. Meanwhile, the woman abandoned her jug of water at the well and hurried back to the village. She seemed thrilled that Jesus was able to tell her everything she ever did, slight oversightment, and still talk with and accept her. See, when he, he didn't just put her down. No. He told her about herself. Mm -hmm. See, that's what I like about, about the Lord. He don't put us down. But when we come to him, he receives us just as we are. Amen. And he told her about herself. And, and guess what? She was excited yeah. about what she had heard. So she ran back to the city.
Adam did not say to her peers, I have found a redeemer, but asked her, could this be the Messiah? Mm -hmm. See, that was the way she didn't say, I found the Messiah, mm -hmm. but could this be the Messiah? Come see a man that has told me everything about myself. The woman's indirect approach aroused the interest of the Samaritans. By simply relating what had happened, the woman generated considerably interest. Large number of residents from Sychar responded to the woman's invitation, not because of what she said, but because of curiosity. See, a lot of us, we come to church not because we want to come to church, but we hear that somebody's here that, uh, that's giving the word or that's, that's giving out blessings or giving out healings. We come because we're suspicious. You know, a lot, not, not a lot of times we come because we want to hear the word. We come because we want, we're looking for something. And, and we're hoping that if it's a prophet in town, that he'll call us out. Yeah. Come on in. That he'll call us out and call out our condition. You know, and when he don't call out our condition, we get, we get mad about it. Yeah. He well, he must not be who he say he is. <laughs> so a lot of us, we're curious. You know, just like when Jesus, uh, 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 Lazarus died. Amen. And, and he told Martha amen, to show me where you laid him. And when he got to the grave site, guess what? He said, not for just because uh, I, I'm, I'm wanting the lashes to come back, but, but for all the believe, unbelievers that's around, that's standing around here, God. He said, I want you to do your work. Yeah. Amen. I want you to show yourself today. Mm -hmm. And that's when he called Lazarus to come back. Mm -hmm. Amen. He called him to come to life again. Amen. For the unbelievers. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people that's in church, been in church for 50 years yeah. or more. And still don't believe. Yeah. Mm. A lot of times we preach stuff, and we preach it, but we still don't believe it. And I saw a I saw a movie on that one time where the preacher was really preaching, and you know people saying amen and all that stuff. You know, been in church for a long time. It was it's uh, the movie um, Heaven Is for Real. I don't know if y'all have seen that or not. Yeah. It's a true movie. But his father was preaching all those many years, and the things that he had been saying, guess what? He didn't even believe it. And when the little boy was telling him about how he had seen Jesus, yeah. how he had been to heaven and what he had seen, guess what? He couldn't believe it. Lord, is this thing really real? Yeah. You know, that I've been, I've been teaching this all along, but, you know, the belief is not really in me. Yeah. You know, so a lot of us have been coming to church for a long time, and the belief is not in us. We're saying things that we don't even believe. Yeah. Amen. We're telling other people that we don't believe ourselves. Yeah. You see a lot of people that can pray for other folks, yeah. but when it comes down to praying for yourself, you get out on your sick bed, guess what? We feel like that we're going, we're going on out of here. Yeah. Amen, because we don't have that belief to believe that the same God that we pray to for somebody else can heal us. Yeah. Come on in here, y'all. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You got to have a testimony. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I've got a testimony. Yeah. Amen, and I like to tell it everywhere I go. He saved me. Yeah. Come on in here. Yeah. You ain't got nothing else to say. You could say, he saved me. Yeah. He turned me out of a world of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. He took me up out of the mock and the merit yeah. and placed my feet on a solid foundation, yeah. and I'm here to witness for him. Yeah. Amen. If you don't have nothing to say, you can tell how good he is. Yeah. Amen. He's good, been good to all of us. Yeah. Come on in here, y'all. Yeah. He's been good to every one of us. Yeah. Oh, he was good to you this morning when you woke up out of your bed. Yeah. And guess yeah. what? You was able to go to your own bathroom yeah. and wash your face. Uh -huh. You was able to eat your own food yeah. that he had given you. Oh, he's good to us. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. That's a testimony within itself. Amen. I'm a miracle within myself. Yeah. Because I got up and I was able to do things on my own. Yeah. There's a lot of people that can't even turn over this morning. Yeah. Have to have somebody to turn, on, turn them over. Have to have somebody to feed them. But God's been good to us. Yeah. That's a testimony. Yeah. Yeah. Tell somebody. Yeah. I hear my sister say, you run and tell everything else. Tell somebody that. Yeah. Tell them that Jesus lives and that he's good. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yes, and he's sir. still doing good things. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Let's talk about the disciples' opportunity to evangelize. John 4, 31 through 38. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps, who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the work for you and have reaped the benefits of their labor. 
same man. Sometimes we, we are doing things that others don't put into work for us. And we reaping what other people have done. Look at, look at slavery time all coming down through the years. I mean, they laid the foundation for us. They went through hardship and everything else for us. Amen. That we might have a right to do some things. Amen. And, and we're, we're not even grateful, saints. We're not even grateful when people go before us and lay the foundation. John the Baptist went before Jesus. Amen. He paved the way before him. Before Jesus came on the scene, John the Baptist was there, paving the way. Amen. Previously, Jesus' the disciples had left him weary and hungry. He was hungry. But he said, I have need to go to Samaria. Because that was a need there. Amen. So that's when he stopped and talked to the woman at the well. And when they returned with the food they had bought, they kept urging the rabbi to eat. And Jesus declined their offer by stating that he had food to eat, which was about which they were unfamiliar. And because his disciples took him literally rather than figuratively, they misunderstood what he meant. In other words, I have food that you don't even know of. And Jesus was talking about a spiritual food. I mean, that's why, saints, we have to feed our spirit. If you're not feeding your spirit with the word of God, and this is on a daily basis, you're not feeding your spirit, guess what? It'll starve. It dies. Amen. That's why a lot of people, guess what, are dead today. Because they ain't fed the spirit. Amen. And they, come, and they come to church and ain't nothing in them. You can't feel anything. You can't do anything. You just sit and you just look and see everybody else rejoicing. Because you haven't fed your spirit. Hmm. And because his disciples took him literally rather than figuratively, they misunderstood what it meant. The son explained that his nourishment came from doing the will of his father and accomplishing his redemption test. A connection exists uh, between work, work and food and the fruit of one's labor as something to be harvested. <laughs> and in the present case, the uh, eternal harvest would be the Samaritans approaching in a distance. Jesus let them know that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. You know, and they were talking about it still four months until harvest. But he said, look around you. And he was talking about people. Amen. He, 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 he gave the insight of a farmer, but he was also talking about people because farmers know when it's, when it's reaping time and when it's sowing. When it's sowing time and when it's reaping time. Farmers know that. But he was saying, look around you. There's a lot of, of harvest here but the labors are few. There's a lot of people in the world that needs the Lord today, but guess what? We as saints are sitting on our do-nothing and we're not doing anything. Amen. And he's telling us the harvest is plentiful, but the labor, we don't want to labor. My Lord. We don't want to labor. We don't want to tell nobody about him. As long as we think that we can make it in, you know, forget you and what you're doing. But see, Jesus would, then none of us will perish. He don't want none of us to perish. He want all of us to come to him. But there's a lot of people that need to know him, and we're too scared to say something about it. Oh, we come to church and we shout and we, we rejoice when we're around each other. But when we get away from each other, what are we doing? I mean, what are you doing on your job? Yeah. Are you acting like a co-workers? Are you telling anybody about him? Yeah. Amen. I know every day there, if there comes a time when you can slip your foot in. And when the door is just cracked open, that's a good time for you to slip in. Because somebody's going to say something about the church folk. Because yeah. people just like to talk about church people mm -hmm. and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Amen. But there's a time in every day that you can, you can talk about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Jesus told his disciples to open their eyes and see the right harvest coming towards them. In other words, this was a, the whole village that was coming, the Samaritan people that was coming towards them. He said, there's a whole harvest that's coming. Open up your eyes and see them. And all of them was coming. And they needed to be saved. They needed to be set free. The Savior urged his followers to look and see that the fields for evangelism were ripe and ready to yield an abundant crop of believers. Amen. The field is ripe. Here's a whole lot of believers coming. Amen. You remember the time when Peter got up and preached uh, of Jesus after they crucified him? And they thought that they were drunk in the morning time? He said, they're not drunk. You know, this, this is what Joel said, that in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon, upon all flesh. He said, these men are not drunk. He, he said, but uh, 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 they're just, they're, it, it's too early in the morning for them to get drunk. But this is just what they said. I will pour out my spirit. Old men will dream dreams. Young men will see visions. 
Amen. That's what's happening today. But we're not using what God has given us. We're not using it. Both those who sow the seed of the gospel and those who reap the harvest of many converts will be overjoyed so that, that so many were bought to eternal life. When pre Peter preached that sermon, there were over 3,000 souls that came to the Lord. And when you stand up and you preach boldly, <coughs> amen. Just like on last Sunday when Jerome and, and Dee was passing that, passing that word around, mm -hmm. uh, many of people heard that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. He said, my word is going to the four corners of the earth. Yeah. And guess what is getting out there? Yeah. It is getting out there. Facebook might not be good for some people, but it's good for the word of God. Because yeah. some people that never went to church are hearing it. Yeah. And some people are getting saved right in the house. Okay. Come on in here, y'all. Yeah. The word is getting out there. So none of us will be able to stand before God and say, God, nobody told me about you. Yeah. Because when we stand, he's going to say, oh, yeah, somebody told you because you was looking at Facebook. Yeah. And you saw me. You heard the woman of God or the man of God talk about me. Amen. You, we don't have no excuse no more, saints. No. All excuses are done away with. Yeah. And when we give our testimony and tell somebody, guess what? We can help somebody. Yeah. Amen. You never know when somebody's getting ready to blow their brains out. You never know when somebody's in a deep depression, getting ready to do something for themselves. Yeah. And here you are, laughing and acting a fool. Amen. And, and giggling and going on when you ought to be telling them about the Lord. Mm -hmm. Amen. We have a chance to do that. And God wants us to do it. So here come a whole village of people that's coming towards them. He said, open your eyes. See all these people coming. Mm -hmm. The harvest is plentiful. Yeah. There's plenty of them. Yeah. He said, there's room for another. Yeah. Millions have come, yeah. but there's still room for one. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's what the Lord said. There's always room. Mm -hmm. But we got to make room for them. Saints, I'm telling you. We got to start doing something for the Lord. Anybody? Let's talk about the fruit of the Samaritan woman's testify, uh, testimony. John 4, 39 through 42. Many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the, because of the woman's testimony. He told, them every, he told me everything I ever did. So when Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed for two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. He came to save the That was his mission. Jesus had a mission here to finish. And his mission was to save the world. Amen. He gave his life that the world could be saved. Amen. He died for you, and he died for me. Amen. He gave up his life. He laid down everything in glory and came down here to a unsent, uh, sinful world, amen, and saved us that we might have a right to true life. Amen. Sacro's uh, residence was amazed that Jesus had such incredible insight into the life of the woman they knew so well. These people knew this woman. She had a reputation. Amen. And no doubt the very ones that talked about her, guess what, they done been with her. The men. Yeah. Amen. That's just like when they caught the woman in adultery yeah. and, and she ran and they took her to Jesus and was ready to stone her. Mm -hmm. Amen. And, and, and uh, uh, all of them, all the men came out to stone the woman. And guess what? Jesus just knelt down and began to write something in the dirt. Yeah. And he said, those of you that without sin cast the first stone. Yeah. And nobody could cast a stone yeah. because probably every one of them had been with her. Yeah. That's all. They bought the woman, but they didn't bring the man. It takes two to tangle. Woman didn't do it by herself. Amen. So there they are. It's the same thing. They're talking about this woman. Amen. And probably them being with her too. And as a result of her testimony, many Samaritans put their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. Amen. Not because she said it, because of the curiosity that they had. The villagers were even more impressed with Jesus when they met him face to face. They insisted that he remain with them. And Jesus stayed for two days. Jesus talked to them so good, guess what? Although they were sinners, the word came to him so the word came to them so good from him that they wanted him to stay. Oh, yes. And him being a Jew, uh -huh. staying with the Samaritans, yes. he broke the barrier. Yes. Amen. Yes. When you know the word yes. and you can talk the word uh -huh. and you're living the word, mm -hmm. when you speak to people, yes. they listen. Oh, it's like E.L. Yeah. yeah, when he spoke, people yes. listened. Well, when Jesus is speaking, are you listening? Yeah. Amen. He's speaking every day. Are we listening? Yeah. 
Amen. He's telling us what we need to do. Are we listening? Yeah. Are we telling somebody? This encounter with Jesus became the basic for the Samaritans declaring him to be not merely a prophet, but the Savior of the world. Yeah. Amen. The response of the Samaritans to Jesus contrasts with that of the Jews that he came to reach. The Samaritans not only believe that Jesus is the Messiah, but also openly declare so to others. So when you tell somebody, they're going to tell somebody else. When you tell somebody about the goodness of him, guess what? They're going to run and tell somebody else. Because what he's done for me and how he lifted me up, he could do the same for you. How he got me up on my sick bed, guess what? He could do the same for you. Amen. When you tell somebody how God has bought you out, when you know nobody else could do it, then, then guess what? They can believe it and know that they, he could do it for, you, for them. He came to his own, mm -hmm. which was the Jews. Mm -hmm. And on his own received him not. Yeah. Aren't you glad that they didn't receive him? Oh, yeah. I'm glad they didn't receive him. Because yeah. that grafted us in. Yeah. Amen. But not only did the Samaritans believe, they declared it to the others. Uh -huh. Amen. Uh, uh, we are here. Uh, for uh, We are the light of the world. Yeah. He has set us out. He set the Jews out. He said, you are the light of the world. In other words, I put you here. You are my people. And you are to bring the other nations in. But instead of them bringing nations in, guess what? They joined in with some of the nations. And they believed in other gods. But he has told us that we are the light of the world. And, then, and we sit out on the hill, guess what? And if somebody is down in the darkness and they see your light, they can come to the light. But if your light is not shining, they can't see that they're in the darkness and you are too. Amen. And it's a sad thing, saints. We got a lot that we can talk about. The Samaritan's woman testimony calls waves in her community. She aroused their curiosity sufficiently that they went to hear Jesus. His words called them to believe in him. And while the story of your life is told, how many people, when the story of your life is told, how many people will be able to say that they saw Jesus because of your testimony? Yeah. When you tell your story, well. how many people do you think is going to tell somebody else or be yeah. saved because of your testimony? Yeah. Sex people can get saved yeah. because of your testimony. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right for the harvest. When we look at our garden, do we spend more time focusing on the flowers or on the weeds. For many of us, our daily struggles with the weeds often take away our enjoyment of the view. A lot of y'all ain't gardeners, so you don't know about that. <laughs> Springs, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Because you know what? Uh, pick those flowers. You got to prune them around them, get yeah. the weeds out. Amen. So, too, with people in our community, we are so intent on being critical of what's wrong with our society that we forget that the opportunities to share the gospel with those who are lost are all around us. And truly those opportunities should excite us. Amen. The way you store up treasures in heaven, this is what Rick Warren said. He said, it's by investing in getting people there. After all, whenever Jesus spoke about monetary treasures, wasn't he actually talking about bringing people into the kingdom of God? Eventually, this was his point to his parable about talents. I mean, you remember the story in the Bible about where the good, good man went away for, on a journey. And he left with his servants one five talents, one two talents, and one one talent. And he stayed away, Judy, for a long time. And when he came back, Amen. He called them all to him. And he said, the five, the one with the five talents told him that he had increased it. In other words, he had gained ten talents. And the one with two said he had increased, increased it. And he, he gained two more talents. He said, well done, my good and my faithful servants. Come on in here. Enter into the joys of the Lord. But the one with one talent, he said, Master, I know you to be a straight man. Yeah. And so I, I, I went out and I hid the talent. Yeah. And I put it in the ground. Uh -huh. In other words, he was lazy. Uh -huh. And he didn't do nothing with the talent. Yeah. 
He only had the one, but he didn't do nothing with it. And Jesus said, depart from me, you lazy work of iniquity. And he was cast over into the fire. Amen. And that's the way it's going to be with us. He has given all of us a talent. Come on in here. <laughs> you might not say amen because it's hitting your feet. I don't care if you don't say amen. But it's hitting your toes. He's given every one of us a talent. Amen. All of us got a gift. And it's up to us to stir the gift up that he has given us. And all the talent that we have, we, we sit down on our talents. Amen. Some are some that he has given to preach. Some he has given to teach. Some to evangelize. Some to lay hands on. Some got singing talents. Some got a, a, a missionary where they, they help, a missionary of helps. That's a lot of talents that's going around. Just because God calls it don't mean that you got to be a preacher. Oh, no, when he calls us, there's many different calls. Amen. But when he calls us and he gives us something, we ought to put it to use. Because when he comes back, saints, I'm telling you, when he comes back and he asks you, what did you do with the talent that I gave you? And you say, Lord, I, I wanted to do this, but people talked about me. They scandalized my name. They put me down. He's going to say, depart, for I never knew you. But if you say, Lord, I done done everything that you told me to do. Not everything, but some of the things that you told me to do. Amen. I know I haven't been good all my life. But guess what I did? What you said to me. He's going to say, come on in. Oh, yeah. That good and that faithful servant. Enter into the joy. Yeah, yeah. I want to hear him say, well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. That's why I want to give out the talent that he has given me. Yeah. I want to give out what he is. The gift that he's given me is not for me. Yeah. The gift that he has given you is not for you. Yeah. Amen. It's for somebody else. Yeah. We ought to be telling somebody, stirring up the gift to tell somebody what the Lord has done. Amen. This gift that I got, amen. If I was, I'm a teacher. Yes. But springs, if I go to my to my mirror, uh -huh. and I look in the mirror, uh -huh. and I see my own reflection, uh -huh. amen, and I begin to talk to that, uh -huh. who's getting anything out of it but me? Uh -huh. huh? Nobody's getting nothing out of that word but me. Yeah. But when I come out here, yeah. and I give you what God has given me, yeah. I know that I, I'm giving you what he told me to give you. Amen. I'm doing a work for him. Yes. Amen. Amen. It might not be easy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. Sometimes the, the journey gets hard. Yeah. But you got to keep on. Yeah. Keep it on. Yeah. Amen. What is clear in Jesus' message is that God reacts strongly to our attitude towards him when he commands us to serve. Mm -hmm. The first two servants sought to please their master by increasing his wealth. While the third servant regarded his master as harsh and demanding. And so he hoarded what was given to him. And that's what a lot of us are doing. We are hoarding what God has given us. Amen. And we're not giving it to nobody. Hence the master called the first two servants good and faithful. But the third servant he called wicked and lazy. So a lot of us are, you ought to be like the ant. I don't know if you read, read about that or not. I think it's over in Psalms. I forget what chapter it's in, but it's somewhere. It talks about the ant and the, and the snail. It's lazy. I mean, a lot of us are snails. The snails in the church, snails in our home, snails wherever we go. I mean, we're just lazy. We're slow. Don't want to do anything. But the ant, if you would, if you would look at the ant, and I studied this too. I studied the ant because guess what? They constantly move. You see the working ants? You see a whole trail of them. They're trailing behind each other. And they're constantly storing up. Amen. They know when the summer is coming. They know when the winter's coming. And they constantly work all the time. You don't see an ant just sitting, just standing in one place. Ant is always moving. That's the way we need to be saints. We need to be moving in the direction of the Lord. Amen. We need to be moving for the things that he had told us to do. It should be the goal of every Christian to have the Lord say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Moreover, it will, extremely, uh, will be extremely wonderful when the Lord also says to us, come and share your master's happiness. That's going to be a glorious day when God tells us to come in and share his happiness. We need to reach out, reach others to Christ. When Jesus encountered 
the Samaritan woman at the well, he asked her for some water. And then he offered her true living water. He said, had you known who it was that asked you for water, you would have asked me for water, and I would have given you living water. Amen. A lot of us need that living water. Come on here. <laughs> Come on here, Jane. In response, she required, what is that living water? And he told her that he was that, that water. And moreover, declared that he is the Messiah. Jesus' disciples were dumbfounded with their master, uh, with, that their master was conversating with a Samaritan woman. But Jesus told them the crop is ripe for harvest. And his message to them, as it is to us, is that there are many people who need him. And we are to share him with everyone. Amen. That's his message. And that's what, that's what, we told, what he told his disciples too. There's many people. Amen. He has given us this gift. God gave us the gift, which is Jesus Christ. And guess what? All of us can have this gift. And guess what? We can share him with everybody. And we can still keep it. Isn't that something? <laughs> yeah. You can share this gift with everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can still keep this gift. Yeah. Amen. Right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And that's that that's what he wants us to do. Yeah. And you know how selfish we are. Yeah. When somebody give us a gift, we don't want to share it. Yeah. Oh no. You get a new pair of shoes, a new suit, a new dress, you ain't sharing it with nobody. <laughs> guess what? That's your gift. Yeah. You don't want to share. Yeah. But this gift that God has given us, yeah. we can yeah. share it. To everybody. everybody. As a matter of fact, the whole world. Yes. Amen. And still have it for ourselves. Amen. God is good. Yes. And it's all good all the time. time. Yes. Amen. I think that's all I got, saints. Right. I'm looking over my notes and things. I had so much. I had so much rope down here. Lord, I'm, it's just too much. All right. But I think I've given out to you what God has given to me. Right. And what God has given to me, I want you to have it because I don't want to keep it to myself. Yes, and I don't want to hear him say, depart from me. Right. I want to hear him say, well done, yes. thy good and thy faithful servant. God bless anybody. Mr. Muffle, we have to be very careful and to understand that a calling and a gift or not to get folk in the church is for us to build the church up. If you look at the fivefold ministry, all of that is used in the church. All of us have a calling and a gift, and that is we're all called to be soul women. Look at that woman. She wasn't a teacher. She wasn't a preacher. She wasn't an evangelist. All she did was say, come see a man. And so on our jobs, in our neighborhood, we're not excited like Brother Jerome was saying, sharing, sharing with people about the goodness of, of God and about salvation. I mean, my preaching is, is, is most of all isolated to this church. So the world ain't going to hear my preaching unless they look at it on Facebook. So me being a preacher, that I, I shouldn't put a whole lot of, uh, of, of stock in that as far as the harvest is white and ready to be harvested. Because mm -hmm. what I'm called to do is encourage the saints, build up the saints as a pastor. But my generic calling, my most important calling is to be a soul man. The Bible says he that went of souls is wise. So we, she started earlier. What is it about us, not our teacher, not our priest, that causes folks only to be turned on to the Lord? They were turned on to the Lord based on what that woman had to say, which was, he told me everything that I ever done. Is, could this not be the Christ? And so that got to curiosity. So when we share with folk what God has done in our lives. Yes. That's soul winning. That's our generic calling. That's our, the most important calling a believer has. We, a lot of times we in the congregation look at preachers and teachers like, you know, they're above us, but we're on the same plane. Right. Our job is to be soul winning as Christians. But in the household of faith, those of us that have gifts and talent, it's used to edify and build up and exalt the body of let me read this to you right here in my little book. It said, it would be nice to know the name of the Samaritan woman. Makes us wonder about other women of faith whose names are lost to history. Many of them have spoken out 
to bring others to faith. Many taught their sons and daughters to pray. Many read scriptures to the children to plant seeds of faith. Some even have lived with unbelieving husbands who finally submitted to Christ as Lord after years of, of patient prayer by their wives. Their names may be unknown to us, but they are not unknown to God. He has written their names in the Lamb's Book of Life. And someday in heaven, we may be able to look into that book and learn that the Samaritan woman, what the Samaritan woman's name was. The name of, of one whose testimony changed her community forever. Will yours? Yeah. Would your name change the community? Forever. God bless you.